All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Haynes. I'm the current primary care sports fellow at Penn State Hershey um, Primary Care Sports Medicine. Um, I did my undergrad at Franklin and Marshall College and was out uh, at Penn State here for medical school and then at Jefferson for family medicine residency and have returned here for um, one year of sports fellowship. So today for our journal club, I'm going to be um, talking about a paper. This was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2022. This is the relative efficacy of intraarticular injections in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis, uh, systematic review and network meta-analysis. So the first thing, I'm just gonna go through a few learning objectives here. Um, we're gonna be just briefly touching on the conservative management for knee osteoarthritis, um, comparing visual analog score and a WOMAC assessment of patient pain and function, um, which we'll go through in a little bit. We're gonna examine the efficacy between the intraarticular treatments that as seen in this study, and then um, one thing of note for this particular meta-analysis is defining these categories of bias that um, they, they looked at between a few of these papers. So just some background, uh, patients spend an average on 13.3 years on non-surgical treatment options for symptomatic knee osteoarthritis before undergoing a total knee arthroplasty, which as you can imagine is quite some time to be dealing with uh, these symptoms, especially if patients are having a good degree, a good amount of pain. Um, so just trying to optimize what conservative measures we have for them uh, is, is very important. There's strong evidence that exists for various conservative measures, um, uh, oral NSAIDs, aerobic exercise, weight loss, particularly with BMI over 25, uh, and then supervised physical therapy programs have all been shown to have, um, uh, have good evidence behind them for helping with pain and function. Um, however, some patients uh, do experience uh, particular barriers, whether they're able to tolerate or take NSAIDs given other medical comorbidities, um, whether they have access to um, uh, supervised physical therapy. Uh, so just looking at other ways that we might be able to help give them um, some relief um, or some improvement in quality of life. So um, the long-term efficacy of intraarticular injections is largely unknown. There have been um, some studies previously that show that they produce positive short-term outcomes, but not as many looking at long-term outcomes. Um, there was a recent uh, prior meta-analysis that was comparing intraarticular injections for, for knee osteoarthritis that reported that cortisone demonstrated uh, superior pain relief when compared with PRP, hyaluronic acid, and placebo. Um, this was, some, this was a, a meta-analysis that looked at 53 randomized control trials, um, but they, uh, the follow-up for this study was limited to 42 days, so just about six weeks. Um, so this uh, paper then that we're looking at today was uh, the goal was to look a little bit further down the road and see um, uh, a long-term efficacy um, comparison. So the, the purpose of the paper, assess and compare the efficacy of currently available intraarticular injections used in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis. The ones included in this paper were hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, platelet-rich plasma, and plasma-rich in growth factors. The plasma-rich in growth factors was one that I wasn't as familiar with, it's just not something I've um, worked with just yet. So uh, I just wanted to briefly mention the, the purpose um, for plasma rich and growth factors or kind of the thought behind how it's functioning. Um, it's promoting growth factor proliferation without furthering cytokine damage. So in a sense, it's, it seems to be similar to what we think about with a leukocyte, uh, leukocyte poor PRP. So there, there's an absence of leukocytes, which could potentially minimize any further pro-inflammatory reactions and may improve the injection uh, efficacy without doing any further damage. So uh, the hypothesis for this paper, there would be no significant differences in treatment outcomes based on the type of intraarticular injection that was used. So the study design, as I mentioned earlier, this was a meta-analysis of randomized control trials. The data was analyzed then to compare effects of the intervention groups with the placebo on patient reported outcomes. So they pulled together data from these randomized control trials. They ended up with, uh, um, with 23 randomized control trials, and we'll kind of go through how they landed on those studies in just a little bit. And then they assessed also for, some, uh, for homogeneity between the studies to ensure a fair comparison of the data outcomes. So this was their inclusion criteria. They had quite a few, um, which then resulted in the number of studies that they, uh, they um, ended up with. So uh, these were some of the criteria they included. They, it was designed as a randomized control trial. It was either written in English or translated into English, uh, included human participants, evaluated similar treatments and outcomes um, with these comparisons of interest. 
evaluated a population with radiographic or clinical evidence of knee osteoarthritis, and then included a minimum of 30 patients per study group and had a minimum of six month follow-up time. Again, one of the big hallmarks of this paper was they wanted a longer follow-up. So they insured six months. This was a um, the flow chart from the paper kind of narrowing down. They started with 4,700 papers and then kind of narrowed down based on which papers were meeting these criteria. Um, the systematic review was performed according to PRISMO guidelines. This is preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And then they narrowed it down at the very end, like I said, to 23 randomized control trials meeting these criteria. Getting into the methods, the, they looked at the mean and mean change from baseline scores regarding pain and function, and they were, were recorded at the six-month follow-up. And then they were converted either to a, on a scale of one to 100, a visual analog score for pain or a zero to 100 Womack score for function. And then for data analysis, they also looked at the minimal clinically important difference um, values, again, compared for pain and function separately. Um, the, these values for statistical significance were based on previously published literature, um, and this was, they used a, a score of 19.1 units for pain, um, visual analog scale as being statistically significant, and then 8.0 units for function as being statistically significant. And then the magnitude of the effect sizes um, were felt to represent potential clinical significance if the value was between 0.5 and 1, and likely clinical significance with the value greater than 1. So this is just thinking through visual analog scale, just a very basic 0 to 10, what's your pain? Um, this And then was converted, as I mentioned, on a scale of 1 to, oh, I'm sorry, of 0 to 100. And then getting into what the WOMAC score is, this is Western Ontario at McMaster University's Osteoarthritis Index. It's used routinely in evaluation of knee and hip osteoarthritis. It's self-administered. It's a questionnaire looking at 24 different questions, but divided into three subscales. The one they really focused on for this paper in particular was looking at physical function, which asks uh, its 17 different items assessing how they're functioning during the day. It does also have some uh, degree looking at pain and stiffness, um, but in terms of assessing physical function, they're asked about um, uh, using stairs, rising from sitting, bending, walking, getting into and out of a car, something like putting on your socks in the morning, getting into and out or, or out of a bathtub. So things on a day-to-day -day basis, just kind of to assess or estimate how patients um, are in terms of their functional status. So this was table one. This was looking at um, the patient characteristics and the number of injections. So in total, with all of the papers kind of pooled together, it was looking at 4,600 injections. Um, some interesting things I thought on this table in particular is if you're looking at the number of injections here of the 4,600, 2,300 of them were hyaluronic acid injections, um, and then only 500 of them were corticosteroid injections. Um, just, I thought something, you know, interesting compared with, um, I guess the proportion of those that we usually see in, in our clinical practice here is just a little bit different, but, um, I, that was one thing I wanted to point out. And then also BMI, I thought was interesting across all of the pooled studies on average, mostly looking at a BMI around 28, um, getting up to 30 was the highest that they looked at. Um, so again, just something a little bit different than, than usually the patient population that we um, treat for osteoarthritis. So um, this, is the, this is another table looking at, um, it's, it's starting to assess kind of some of the um, homogeneity or heterogeneity between some of the studies to uh, uh, assure that the comparisons were equal when looking at the data. Um, but overall, it indicates no significant difference between looking at direct and indirect evidence within the network. So kind of assuming homogeneity for their pain and function outcomes. Um, the other thing of note for this table is starting to look at um, which we'll get into with the um, with some of the other tables here, but looking at that PRP versus the hyaluronic acid was one of the only um, one of the only modalities in both pain and function that was clinically significant um, as being superior to hyaluronic acid. So getting into results, um, all our all intraarticular treatments except for corticosteroids were found to result in statistically significant improvement in outcomes when compared with placebo. Um, this I thought was um, this is I thought was interesting. It is in contrast to the previously published studies, though again the prior studies were not um, looking at as long of a follow-up time. That prior study in particular they kept referencing was six weeks and as compared with six months. And then PRP was found to possess the highest probability of efficacy, um, then followed by pl plasma rich in growth factors hyaluronic acid, then corticosteroid, and then placebo. 
So these are two um, forest plots looking at, uh, as you can see on the left is pain improvement, on the right is function improvement. So starting with the left, again, you can see PRP has the um, demonstrated the largest difference in, in patient outcomes for pain and in function. And then corticosteroid had the lowest in terms of pain and function improvement. And these, again, are looking at these minimal clinically um, significant uh, differences between the groups. This table, they then actually pooled some of these even together and looked at some mixed treatments or mixed effects for pain and function. So they looked at, um, they looked at uh, the top half of this table is looking at pain. Um, the, the modalities that were statistically significant are bolded. So you can kind of see under pain, um, hyaluronic acid and PRP, um, that, that value was clinically significant or statistically significant, I'm sorry. Um, but then the only um, of the five mixed treatment comparisons of pain outcomes uh, in the top, three of these had effect sizes that were large enough to have potential for clinical significance. However, none of them were actually deemed clinically significant for pain outcomes. In the bottom, um, again, you can see there are five mixed treatment comparisons for function outcomes um, that were statistically significant that are shown in bold. Um, and of those three, the ones that I have highlighted in the blue boxes here, three had clinical significance, um, and that is comparing corticosteroid versus PRP, placebo versus PRP, and placebo versus uh, plasma rich in growth factors. And then this was just one other way to represent the data here. Um, again, looking all the way on the right for PRP, each of these bars represent pain, function, and then combined uh, respectively. So just a bar chart looking at um, outcomes for pain, function, combined, and then you can kind of see it kind of tapering off as we go towards the left side of the graph towards um, hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, and placebo. And then this was the, uh, again, just one more way to list it in a table form of um, looking at pain function related improvement and then pain and function improvement combined um, and just in that same order of outcome. <coughs> Lastly, this was um, the, a figure looking at risk of bias, um, particularly in these meta-analysis, uh, kind of comparing some of the papers and pooling the data together, wanting to kind of identify any areas of bias that might exist. So the first one that it's talking about here, allocation concealment, so selection bias. So overall, just making sure that researchers are not um, consciously or unconsciously assigning participants from one group to another. Um, there was one trial they mentioned that had unclear, uh, that had unclear methods of doing this, um, so they didn't really specify. So that was listed as an unclear risk of bias. And then um, one that was performed that they did not at all, um, they, they, this, uh, researchers just kind of selected who was going into which, which bucket. So um, they put that as a high risk of bias. There wasn't a true like randomization process. Um, the other one of note was the, for performance bias, blinding of participants. There were six studies in the, 20, in the group of 23 that were not blinded. Um, others did not report whether they were blinded. So that's where they put is that kind of red bar, that high risk of bias, and then that unclear risk of bias. Some of the other ones, um, detection bias is um, kind of blinding the outcome assessment. Overall low risk studies were um, generally um, um, collecting their outcome measures the same. So they didn't really feel that there was any concern for uh, bias there or a low risk, I should say. Um, and then looking at attrition bias, um, how many were lost to follow up? They had a very minimal um, lack of follow up or lack of um, data reporting uh, bias, but they did list it as unclear in some of those studies. Other than that, selective reporting, um, just kind of reporting bias, how the patients were um, subjectively measuring their pain and function, um, they also put as low risk of bias. So some limitations they mentioned in this study, um, they did not compare any of these with oral medications. They weren't included anywhere in the meta-analysis as well as physical therapy and exercise modalities. Um, physical therapy and exercise, you know, they, they mentioned that, unfortunately it's hard to compare something like that in this kind of setting, particularly comparing the head to head with these injections. There's a lot of variability in uh, heterogeneity in programs and um, physical therapy uh, prescriptions and how those things could be directly compared. So that's why some of those were not as included. Um, PRP and plasma rich and growth factor, unfortunately are requiring an out-of-pocket payment. So that, you know, can, place them at a higher risk of bias because of financial investment. So that's something that is, um, has to be considered as well. Leukocyte concentration in these papers was infrequently reported in the PRP studies. So the um, challenge there is sometimes can't compare differences in whether they were using leukocyte rich versus leukocyte poor and how, those, how they exactly <coughs> did those. And then um, they did have a pretty strict, as you saw, inclusion and exclusion criteria that resulted in a lower number of studies that were included um, than I think what they were anticipating. So the authors concluded 
PRP yielded improved outcomes when compared with plasma rich in growth factor, hyaluronic acid, corticosteroid, and placebo for the treatment of symptomatic knee osteoarthritis at a minimum six month follow up. And just getting into a few kind of discussion points, so would this change your practice? Um, I, I, for me, I, I wasn't terribly surprised that corticosteroid was not, um, did not perform as well on long term efficacy. Um, that seems to fit pretty well with, um, with what we see in our patients. Um, I think some things that I kind of thought about when considering if this is something that would change practice, the study population, like I said, wasn't exactly, didn't exactly fit um, what the same kind of population of patients that we normally see. Um, usually on average, I would guess a little bit of a higher BMI, lower proportion of hyaluronic acid injections. Um, so just in terms of looking forward, um, uh, maybe a more generalizable population, study population might be beneficial. Um, I think the other thing that's hard is a big, you know, financial barrier for use of platelet-rich plasma and uh, plasma-rich and growth factors. Um, even if this is something that is showing um, that they that the PRP had superior long-term patient outcomes, it's hard to kind of just turn around and start recommending that for every single patient, um, given that it's not currently something covered by a lot of insurances. Um, and then the other thing that I um, wanted to point out, I was having a hard time kind of um, uh, looking through some of these studies in terms of. A lot of them uh, didn't always mention the severity of osteoarthritis when they had them. They were just kind of saying that they, this, this uh, particular paper just mentioned knee osteoarthritis, but wasn't mentioning, was this mild, was this moderate? Is there some heter heterogeneity there? Because as we know, particularly with these intraarticular injections, sometimes it's, it's not always a one size fits all. Hyaluronic acid um, theoretically is not something that is always, does not always have as strong of data in severe knee osteoarthritis you know, sometimes corticosteroid is not even working any longer in the osteoarthritis if it's severe. So I think that's something else to kind of just keep in mind when looking at um, some of the data that was pooled for this. So takeaway points, um, PRP had superior long-term patient outcomes in pain and function when compared with other interventions, but um, overall, as, as usual, the need for further study on longer-term outcomes and maybe a little bit more of a generalizable population. Um, I think something else that uh, was interesting, there, there was a recent, um, I think 2020 New England Journal article that was comparing P, uh, PT and corticosteroid and that PT had better outcomes at one year. So again, just maybe looking at, um, uh, I, th I think it'd be interesting also to continue looking at some of that when compared with the intraarticular treatment modalities. So that was, that's all I had on my end, references and questions or discussion. Good talking. Yeah. So why, one, one comment that you, you said you were surprised by the numbers of um, injections that were done and how that is not really reflective of our practice and our patients. So one thing that I'll point out is, is these studies are not how many injections are being done. Mm -hmm. These are a reflection of studies that are, have six month follow-ups. Yeah. So you're going to have more numbers in the hyaluronic acid because there's more studies at mm -hmm. six months. So it's not that it's a reflection of like, wow, they're doing a whole lot of hyaluronic acid injections. That's just what the studies are showing in a six month follow up. So I think that's why the numbers are off. If we went back, I mean, you can't say that for sure, but I'm sure if you went back and like looked at those practices, they're doing a lot of, of corticosteroid injections as well, yeah. just not the six month follow ups for the study. Sure. Um, I, I, the other thing I just want to ask is I had the same thought, right? As you're, you're, you're kind of going through, I was surprised that there was not a good response for corticosteroid at six months. Why, why, I was, you said you were surprised. I was surprised. Why are we surprised at that? That there was a, that, that, there, that there was not great response at, oh. at six months. You said you were surprised at that. I was surprised at that too. Why? Oh, I, th I thought I wasn't as surprised just because I feel like usually that's something that when, when at least when, when I have talked with patients about how long they usually get relief for, I feel like it's usually that they get relief for a month or two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I thought you said you were surprised. So the first time I read oh. this, I was like, oh man, wow. And it's all because of how it's written. Yeah. It's written that like surprising result, it's less, you know, for corticosteroids. And then I kind of thought back and I was like, I never tell people they're going to get six months yeah. of relief. Uh, but it, just the way the author chose to present that piece of the information kind of highlights that you don't get six months, which is something that clinically has been shown and, and we're all talking about our patients. Yeah. And I, I think also, I think, like you said, in how they presented it, I think it, they also kept kind of referencing, oh no, that that's in direct contrast with the prior study, but the prior study, again, being six weeks, that's, you know, a big, a big difference. I feel like we have a lot of patients that are still feeling good relief at six weeks. So then, you know, looking longer term though, it's not something that unfortunately will tend to last. <laughs>
think the lack of a grade of arthritis yeah. is a significant limitation, and yeah. it's not the authors that had that limitation, it's the studies that they included. Yeah. Um, what scale is <coughs> used? If you're going to design the study mm -hmm. uh, to look at this, what scale would you use to grade the arthritis? Do you know the name of it? Called the Kelvin and Warren scale, and that's okay. what you'll see published. It's very similar to Lomac. They're kind of like the standards for arthritis studies, especially of the knee. Um, so, and they grade, you know, mild, moderate, severe, and they grade zero through four. So, when you're designing a study looking at your arthritis, scaling how much arthritis burden there is, I think is really important because I think we squirt in joints regularly that are bone on bone arthritis. And I always wonder, like, what possible impact do we have when it's truly just mechanical? Like, yeah. there's like not, there's no space left. The other two other real quick comments Womack, if you ever do a study, you or Ashley, if you guys ever do a study on arthritis, knee arthritis, you have to pay to use Womack. Yeah. It's yeah. not free. You can get it, you can download it free from the internet, but you actually have to pay to use that, to use that scale. So that's an important thing when you're doing study design is to know what's a free instrument that you can use for surveys and what's actually not. And Womack is patented. So you have to pay for that. So you have to pay to use it in a study. If you want to use it for a patient, I don't, I don't believe you have to. I think it's just if you're going to do it for a, a study that is later published. I can't confirm or deny that. I know you can't. I know you can't use it for research study. Yeah, for sure. And then the last thing I just want to mention is uh, the one part I would have loved them to have included because uh, I love their table looking at risk of bias. That that graph that you mm -hmm. showed, Caitlin, was yeah. awesome. I would love to know how many of the studies they had industry bias. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, because no one, there's no industry out there that's sponsoring corticosteroid knee injection as a primary treatment. Like mm -hmm. no one's looking. But there will be tremendous industry bias, I think, around the drug yeah. and hyaluronic acid. So that that I think would have been helpful and would have been easy for them to have actually include in this in this review. They could have actually just reported on their 23 studies. This is the percent that had industry bias. I think that would have been a helpful yeah. um, add-on. So yeah, absolutely. I was surprised too that the winding of patients um, was actually so good in comparison. Like I was mm -hmm. expecting it to be super low because when we inject corticosteroid versus hyaluronic acid versus <laughs> obtaining blood for PRP, how does the patient not know the difference if they've ever seen or felt one of those before? Um, so I was expecting the blinding actually to be a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I like that you commented on the BMI of being 28 um, when we know that there's a huge um, proportion of patients with obesity who have arthritis. I'd say the majority of my patients are obese that I'm injecting with arthritis. So yeah. this was very unusual. And, and this systematic review was international. Mm -hmm. So these people, these studies are coming from all over the world. Um, so is it generalizable to your practice, do you think? Um, what you see here in central Pennsylvania? Not, not currently, no. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't think so. Uh, but at the same time, what do you overall? So we can sit here and poke holes and studies all we want, right? That's the easy part, it's journal club. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, when you just when you look at this study compared to a lot of things that are published and that, that are out <laughs> there, I mean, what's your sense on um, the information you can take from this? Like, do, is this information that you can use in your practice, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think that, um, again, I think one of the big ones just is, you know, I feel like we have patients all the time that ask us when we're doing an injection, whether it's, I mean, I know this one's just looking at knees, but, you know, I, I feel like we get it all the time. Like, how long is this cortisone injection going to last? And I think that, I mean, I'm, I feel like we're usually very upfront with patients and just say it's hopefully we'll get you long term relief, but we know that it's it's not something usually that's going to be you know lifelong. They may not have reversal of their, it's not treating the arthritis, it's just a way to help with pain. So I think just this this article being one that is showing some some data that's that it doesn't have a good long-term uh, efficacy and just letting patients know that it may not be a long-term solution uh, for their pain management. And then also just 
another study looking um, looking at or some more data looking at PRP for possibly for future kind of management of osteoarthritis. I know it's not something that's you know as readily available right now, and it's not as something as financially uh, available for everybody. But I think if we can continue to look at some good solid data behind it, I think that in the future it could be. So I think that's something that we can continue to talk about with patients. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this makes it a, a valid uh, treatment option. Mm -hmm. uh, and this data is similar to PRP data with tendon mm -hmm. um, tendinopathy. So, you know, we, we know in the tendinopathy PRP literature that uh, people are getting better at six months uh, and beyond um, after a PRP. Um, so what, what do I take away from this? I mean, I, so I, my, I would say that, uh, that the lighter patients maybe with less severe osteoarthritis, which is what we've seen in our practice here, might be good options for PRP. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly a valid option based on the numbers here. Um, so I, I think it's useful. Um, is it the best evidence? Um, it's, it's pretty good, um, but you know, it has limitations, um, but, um, but it, it's, it's a good article. So um, thank you for present, uh, presenting that. Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. I also just to mention just the systematic review versus meta-analysis. The fact that you would actually do a meta-analysis yeah. and not be limited just to a systematic review, it's pretty remarkable that they actually had enough studies um, that met their inclusion criteria. Because they, yeah. they have good inclusion criteria yeah. in terms of how they were reviewing the studies. We yeah. care what happens six months out, yeah. not just one month or two months or three months, but short, short, short term so, Yeah. So, hey, guys. I'm one other quick comment before we switch over to the next study, just thinking about this sort of re-ranking how we think about injections or you know, progression of injections for going from steroids, uh, HA, PRP. You also keep in mind the time of the year uh, as people's uh, uh, copays or uh, deductibles reset in January. I know I have a lot of patients you know, who shy away from HA injections sometimes they're getting stuck with the full price of it. Uh, PRP in that case may actually be a cheaper option. And now I feel a little better with some of this data that may be a, a good six month option for pain control for the patient. So that could be something to consider as we get into January and February before people hit their deductibles. If they're looking at the same cost or a cheaper cost for PRP, that might, this might be a little more uh, ammo for you to say that, you know, that's going to give you some pretty good benefit. Again, probably in the right patient, but I think may take the time of year into consideration with some of your treatment decisions there. Good point, Bill. Yeah. Cool. Oh, all righty. Great. I'll log off here. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks, guys. Okay, hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Sturtz. I'm the primary care sports fellow at Penn State University at our location up in State College. Um, I went to William Mary for college, went back home to New Jersey at Rowan for medical school, and then I've been with Penn State Health since then. I did my family medicine residency down in Hershey and now here in State College. Um, for our journal club presentation today, um, I decided to focus on a topic that I think Caitlin and I have seen a lot of recently in the past month or two. Um, so looking at ice hockey in particular, um, we both have definitely had a lot of that on our schedules recently. Um, this was a study done in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that was published in February of this year, looking at the um, risk for injuries and concussions in body checking in our adolescents, ice hockey players. So why do we care? Um, ice hockey is a very popular winter sport. Um, I will say that this whole study was done in Canada. So while I see how popular it is here in central Pennsylvania, we all know it's definitely extraordinarily popular of a sport in Canada compared to the US. Um, these statistics from the study are primarily focused on Canadian data. So they have over 500,000 youth hockey players in Canada. Um, when you compare that to the U.S., we have about 380,000 youth hockey players under the age of 18 in a given year, and their most recent data set from USA Hockey. So slightly less, but still a large amount. 
And particularly in Canada, in the age groups below the age of 15, um, there are over 70,000 players. So still a very large portion in those younger age groups overall. Um, there's a high burden of injury with youth athletes, particularly in ice hockey. So when you look at the Canadian sports data for the youth athletes, um, ice hockey players account for 10% of all the youth injuries that they have recorded. So when you think about that for one sport, that's a pretty high amount. And the injury rates tend to be relatively high and concerning when they start adding in body checking based on prior studies. So you can see there um, about eight injuries per, um, per 1,000 game hours, and then about 3.3 concussions for 1,000 game hours will happen when youth athletes body check. So what is body checking? Definition from Canadian ice hockey um, and also accepted by US ice hockey. So it's intentional body contact with an opponent using their body to stop the attacking player or to separate the opponent from the puck. So when you think about it, when we watch like college and professional ice hockey, we definitely see a lot of this. Um, but the question is, how steep is this, especially when we're looking at children below the age of 15? So Canada changed their policy within the past five years. They started banning body checking at their 13 years old and younger level. Um, so 13 now is the suggested age that you can start body checking. Um, there have been some studies that were done when they put that ban in place that showed that there's about 50% reduction in their youth injuries overall in ice hockey in those players under 13 and also a 64% reduction in concussion, which both of those numbers sound quite large and quite impressive. So that's why this study really looked into how beneficial this might be going forward for ice hockey athletes. So really where it's controversial is they're considering if these players that are like 10, 12, 13, don't learn to body check, when they get older, Will they get hurt when they start by checking at like 14 or 15 because they haven't learned how to do that properly? So their study goal was ultimately to provide further evidence regarding youth ice hockey body check policy changes. And their hypothesis was that there would be no association found between body checking experience and the rates of injury or concussion. So the methods they use, this is a prospective cohort. So when you look at the study, this is actually a strength in this study because of prior ice hockey youth injury studies. Most prior studies were focused on a single season with only one or two teams. You'll see in this study, they did it across six seasons between 2013 and 2018. Um, and that allowed them to get more of a longitudinal perspective and many seasons of data to sort of strengthen the point they were trying to support. Um, their inclusion criteria was U15 hockey players. So that specifically only includes 13 and 14 year olds. So just players in those two ages. Um, the leads had to include, accept body checking and there needed to be parental and coach consent. Um, the locations, they chose three locations across Canada to try and get a variety so they weren't limited to just one region. A limitation with this including criteria is that since leagues have, leagues have to include body checking, um, no women's or girls leagues were included because there are no youth women's leagues that allow body checking. So you'll notice when you see the data, it's basically all focused on 13 to 14 year olds. So the data collection, they tried really hard to get a selection of tools that were validated to sort of set up a baseline. So they used the preseason baseline questionnaire um, to figure out uh, prior injuries they might have had that could sort of sway the data. Um, they had a representative fill out a weekly exposure sheet sort of documenting the injuries for the different athletes on a given team that was part of the study. And then an injury report form 
was completed on any game day injury that occurred. So only injuries from games, nothing that happened in practice. And those forms were completed by study selected athletic trainers and physical therapists only. So that information from the injury report form played a big part in the data analysis that they did. Um, the outcomes that they looked at were injuries that had greater than seven days of lost time or concussions that had greater than 10 days of lost time. Um, and those are numbers that they felt were really supported in prior studies for ice hockey injury so that they could have some consistency in comparison with prior studies. So the results, when we start to look at this, um, overall, there were um, 1,842 player seasons, and they broke these down into those 13 and 14 year olds that had no body checking experience, one year, and two or more years. The max they could have was three total years, um, just based on the way the um, current policies in the Canadian ice hockey was arranged. And you can see there the numbers are relatively similar across each group, which made for a nice comparison. Um, the median number of weeks of participation was about 20 weeks um, for each athlete that was included, but ranged anywhere from just four weeks or up to 30 weeks. Um, as mentioned, they only included injuries that happened in games. So it's important to know that the athletes that we are including were in games. Um, so 96.3% had at least one week where they played a game. Um, the average number of weeks that any given player was in game time was about four weeks. And that doesn't um, include how many games happened in a single week. Because as we know with ice hockey, they may have a couple of games in a single week. So they gave this huge table of just their baseline data. And I think it has a lot of good information of just how they're able to equally balance out um, different regions of Canada, the seasons that players played, um, as well as the number of years they've been body checking. Um, the most important thing that I just pointed out is when you're looking at the category of just gender here, uh, you'll see that in the vast majority of the categories, there are no female athletes. There are small numbers that you'll see. Um, so four, three, 12, three, and six. So those are um, girls that chose to participate in the boys league, um, which is great that they were able to have that experience, but it's not really enough from a number standpoint to really be able to apply this data to um, girls ice hockey necessarily. So then sort of delving into the charts more, um, with the way their data came out, there was nothing found to be statistically significant. So unfortunately, the study, they didn't include any graphs or charts um, to assist in uh, the process of their data, sharing their data. Um, this table is table two from the study. It's looking specifically at injuries, not concussions. Um, so what they used were the incidence rate ratio as well as the absolute risk reduction to see if there is a difference in the amount of injuries that occur in athletes that had no history of body checking a year's worth of body checking experience or two or more. They did do this across all injuries as well as that um, specific category of seven days of lost time after an injury. Um, and particularly when you look at the absolute risk reduction here, our all injury category, our null reference here is of one. And you'll see that in the uh, one year category, uh, there's actually a negative risk. So thinking that the amount of injuries sort of decreases there, 
whereas this number is positive and above one, so maybe a slight increase. Uh, but unfortunately, you'll see with the confidence intervals, they cross that one point either way, so they're not statistically significant. Um, you'll see the same, exact same pattern here um, when you look at the injuries that had greater of seven days lost. When you look at the concussion outcomes in table three, it's a range exactly the same, just with the 10 days lost in that second column rather than um, seven days that we used for injuries. Uh, when we looked at these as well, um, when you look at that absolute re risk reduction in the one year category and the two year category, you have positive numbers on both sides here for overall concussion and same for. Um, the days of time lost. But as you can see with both the confidence and polls across that point of one. Um, so it's not statistically significant as well. Ultimately, the results they went on to further analyze by years of play, position, athlete weight, and the level of play. So they considered the top 20% of leagues to be considered elite and the 80% below that to be sort of like our standard players. Um, and across all of those, there was no statistically significant difference in the numbers of years of exposure to body checking for our 13 and 14 year olds. Um, ultimately from this, they did sort of break down some injury rates a little further. They found that across all groups, that head and neck injuries were by far the most common. And you can see, while it's not statistically significant, there's actually a decrease in the percentage that happened in head and neck injuries if they had more body checking experience. Um, same with concussions. So concussions, there was a similar decrease if they had more years of body checking experience, but it wasn't statistically significant. So ultimately, when they looked at this, there were a couple of things that came to mind. Ultimately, their hypothesis was very much supported by this data because there was no statistically significant difference in the number of years of body checking that the athletes had with regard to the rates of injury or concussion at that U15 level in Canadian youth ice hockey. They did find that, at least in lighter players, so those under 40 kilograms, that there was a significantly higher rate of injury. And this was one of the only points where there was a small amount of statistical significance. And that was across all experience with checking or not body checking, but it was something that fit with um, some prior data. Uh, there was a 74% increase in the rate of concussions in lighter players too across all experience with body checking, but this was not considered statistically significant. Um, so that was something to keep in mind as well. They looked at different positions and found that forwards had the highest risk for both injury and concussion, and that one of the risk factors that stood out were a history of injury or concussion to predispose athletes to having um, another injury or concussion. So there are several limitations with this study. Um, the first being that the volume of body checking is not something that we know for each athlete. We just know if they were playing in a league where they body checked or not. We know that some athletes might be more aggressive or advanced in their skills and might body check more often. And we weren't able to differentiate that within the data analysis. Um, as I mentioned several times along the way, game-related injuries were the only ones included. So anyone who had injury at practice, which absolutely can happen, was not included in this study. Uh, there were many factors that could compound return to play. So when they selected that seven days lost time after injury or the 10 days after concussion, um, there are a lot of factors that play in, um, such as if the next game coming up, how important that was to the athlete, um, if there were other illnesses going on, the severity of the injury, and we just don't have access to those 
um, more specific details that could have been contaminating factors on the class. They got that to an escape. Um, questionnaires that they used, particularly the first one to look at the patients, the an athlete's prior um, histories of injury, have some recall bias with it because it's dependent on the patient's memory. Um, the injury report form doesn't have that bias with it as much because we had study selected athletic trainers and physical therapists that were really giving us information on the current injuries that are happening during the study period. Um, there are very few female participants, and there was also a set of selection bias. So they were limited in the number of teams they were able to pick up because each team that was included in the study, they needed to have both parents and coaches on board. And they also needed someone to volunteer as a reporter for the weekly injury report forms. Um, and they found that there were several teams that while the parents and coaches were able to participate, they didn't have a willing volunteer for a couple of years to fill out those weekly forms. Um, so that limited their team selection slightly. Ultimately, the conclusion they got from this was that there was no increased risk for injury or concussion associated with body checking experience at the U15 ice hockey level. Um, the reason this is important is because right now, both in the US and in Canada, they don't allow ice hockey um, body checking below the age of 13. So this U15 group is currently the first age group where they're supposed to start learning to body check. And what they found with this study is that U15 age group, there doesn't seem to be an increased amount of injuries or concussions that are occurring. So there's probably not a risk for greater injury from not learning to check body check when you're younger. Um, it seemed like just from reading and looking further into this, um, there's a lot of just like experiential evidence from coaches and players that they feel like you're more likely to get hurt if you don't learn to body check when you're young. But this study is a larger study, a longer study. It really helps to say that's not actually true. Um, if we can let our athletes stay healthy and safe when they're below 13, they can still learn to body check in this adolescent range of 13, 14, 15, safely. And that is my presentation. Thanks, Ashley. Yep. There's a corollary to this, and this is in uh, the, the kind of young football as well, in terms of um, when they're being taught uh, to hit at practice, there's a corollary there with what they're doing with ice hockey. Same with heading the soccer ball. Um, uh, in soccer, youth soccer, and when they're allowed to attempt to hit the ball to avoid collisions. So I think ice hockey is actually um, really progressive on this, though. I'm glad that they had a they have a longer term study with big numbers to show this. I will say that in 15 years of covering a pro hockey team, I just don't see injuries at practice. Um, anecdotally, that may be because pro athletes are not hitting each other at practice or saving that for games. I'd be interested to know, like from Phil at Penn State, with uh, Penn State ice hockey, if you see a lot of injuries coming out of practice. Um, yeah, the same thought there, kind of think, going back between like watching football practice and watching hockey practices. Hockey's a lot more, you know, focusing on skills and plays during practice. So even at the college level, yeah, they're not doing as much hitting and then just the injuries that we see aren't concussions necessarily uh, that are practice related. So uh, I think that's, I mean, it's, I'm not sure if it's in the nature of hockey where they're not focusing on hitting as much in practicing and focusing more on plays and skills. Jason Casey with our V3 school, do you work the cops even? They're, they're not, I, as far as I know, they're not doing much hitting in practice. The, the injuries we see are more uh, falls and, accidental stuff that isn't related to checking. So I, I agree a limitation could be that it didn't include practice and just focused on games, but I think that's where the lion's share of entries are likely coming, at least anecdotally, Ashley, I'm not Yeah, No, sure that's really interesting. Just, yeah. I don't have much experience with 
I, mostly just game time for ice hockey, not so much practice. Um, so it's actually good to know just from like an overall standpoint of like how they like learn to play and sort of develop their skills. Yeah. So Matt, you made the connection with like heading in soccer and, and youth football, but I'm I'm not familiar with a six year longitudinal study like this. So, you know, we, we try to implement these like safety protocols, but we don't really know the downstream ramifications. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded when I was in residency, I met Robert Cantu at a conference and I asked him, I said, what do you think about all the changes in youth football and high school football? They're doing less hitting in college. What's that going to do long term? And I know we're being recorded here. So if Robert, if Dr. Cantu ever hears this, I hope he's OK with my uh, impression. So he goes, well, son, I think you've been listening or you've been drinking Roger Goodell's Kool-Aid. There ain't no chance it does anything to adult tackling. That is crap. And I was like, thank you, sir, very much. <laughs> so I, I would like to see the like a similar study done on kind of youth football into high school football or or, or similar. Yeah, I mean, I think that we would see that on um, heading in soccer, because I know just being on sidelines of soccer games, like injuries and concussions we get from that can get pretty significant. Um, so I think it's awesome that they were able to do this. And I think Canada was a great spot a large number of players to be able to draw to do a larger and longer study like this. So it was just a really nice setup from a nice hockey standpoint. One of the things that I liked that this study did was they did mention um, injuries by weight. And I think it was a good thing to evaluate at this age because some of them are gonna start hitting gross spurts and start bulking up and then you're gonna have a smaller group um, as well who they did show was more prone to injury. Um, and so that was nice to have that breakout as well. Yeah, it was interesting reading the discussion. Some smaller studies that were a decent amount older showed that heavier players were more at risk for like injuries occurring, which is sort of counterintuitive. So the data that they supplied with the weight for this really helps support. Because if you have a child that weighs a lot more body checking a smaller kid, my instinct would be that the smaller kid's gonna get hurt. Um, and this study has be a better body of evidence supporting that thought. I'd love for you and Caitlin, as you think about your future careers and scholar, I know you're both interested in scholarship and how you wanna look at asking questions and answering those questions. I love Ashley that you actually took the time to like note that coaches and um, maybe parents had the perception that making that rule change would have led to more injury because the kids just weren't as um, experienced with body checking. And you, this study actually answered the opposite, right? So I love asking questions based on people's anecdotes and actually demonstrating, is that true or not true? Um, and that's, uh, those, those, we need more of those studies in sports medicine, I feel, because I think a lot of stuff is done based on people's experience or anecdotes, and it's it's ripe for research to answer those questions. So um, as you guys are moving forward in your careers, I think that's a great opportunity for both of you to think about those questions that you're coming up with as fellows and how you can answer those um, in your next phase. I, I was going to make a comment similar to that. You know, my, my question was, well, they have this big data set and five years worth of data. And so why is it the, the, the question that they really wanted to document here was regarding experience around body checking, not just the including body checking or not, but like the experience of body checking is the is the is the exposure that we're looking at statistically uh, to seeing how it's affecting the disease state. Um, and that was my question. Where do you think that came from? But yeah, so you just answered it. Um, you know that the perception was is that uh, from the parents and coaches uh, who have traditionally done this teaching is that, well, we start checking earlier so we can teach them how to do it. Um, and this shows that that doesn't necessarily play a role. Um, you know, I, I think there's still a lot. I, I think that we're seeing um, decreased injury rates because of rule changes. Um, and, you know, in football, they have been able to show that by decreasing um, the number of uh, active hitting days in preseason, 
you're seeing a decreased incidence of concussions coming out of preseason. Uh, NFL has been able to demonstrate that already. You know, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, I, I would, I, you know, when it comes to football, you know, I think we have a big issue with offensive players being able to use the top of their helmets as a weapon, and nobody's addressed that yet. Um, targeting is addressing the defenders, uh, but we're allowing the offensive players to ram their heads straight forward with the crown of their heads and hit defensive players. So it's an unfair advantage from an offense and defense standpoint. And so if the offensive players start to pay attention to that too, uh, maybe we don't have as many head head collisions because uh, there's not two helmets down. Um, so there's, I think, when you think about how can we be innovative uh, in rule changes to decrease injury incidents, I think there is a lot of room and space uh, to make uh, sports safer. Um, and so this is just, example of the type of data we need to, to prove that. So thank you, Ashley, for presenting that. Yeah, great job, Ashley. Good job, Ashley. Thank you. Great job. Thanks.